As winter approaches in the middle of a global pandemic, it's a question that many of us are asking. Should we get the influenza vaccine, otherwise known as the flu jab or flu shot? There's a number of associated big questions. Does having the influenza vaccine make you subsequently more or less likely to then catch COVID? Uh, and what happens if you do? Is the infection more or less severe? What happens if you catch flu and COVID at the same time? And if you've already got long COVID, could taking the flu jab actually trigger a horrible relapse of symptoms? There are a lot of opinions out there, and like all opinions do, they vary. What we really need is data. So I did some research. Let's go through it. But before I throw some numbers at you, let's quickly catch up on some general pandemic news. Firstly, the New York Times reports a new preprint study suggesting that COVID long haulers may be experiencing autoantibodies, which could be responsible for their continued symptoms. I touched on this in my last film with the anti-serotonin antibody persistence theory. Well, now we've got some evidence that the immune system is reacting in this way. And as a consequence of that, there is some good news and some bad news. Firstly, the good news. Using existing tests that can detect autoantibodies, doctors could identify patients who might benefit from treatments used for lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. And bad news. If the autoantibodies do turn out to be long-lasting, they may result in persistent, even lifelong problems for COVID-19 survivors. You never really cure lupus. They have flares, and they get better, and then they have flares again. That does sound a little bit like the old long COVID relapse, doesn't it? But before we get too depressed, let's quickly move on to some more good news. The Oxford AstraZeneca Phase 3 trials are going well, and it's possible that the first doses might even be available before the end of the year. This would be an incredible result. Still, let's not count our chickens. Uh, let's look at a vaccine that has been approved and is widely available for use. There are some very good reasons why you might want to take the influenza vaccine. Flu isn't just a deeply unpleasant experience, it can also be fatal, especially for those in vulnerable groups. There's also evidence that catching flu and COVID at the same time could double your risk of death. But our Antipodean friends have just had one of the mildest flu winters on record, mostly due to the measures taken to control the coronavirus pandemic. It's not unreasonable to assume that the measures to control the pandemic we're seeing in the Northern Hemisphere could equally reduce the risk of there being a large flu season here too. And could there be a risk in taking the vaccine itself? There has been some correlation between countries with the highest COVID-19 death rates also having the highest rates of influenza vaccine uptake among the elderly. Could this be the flu vaccine making the chances of catching COVID higher or uh, making an infection more severe once you've got it? Well, as I've said on this channel before, the immune system is complicated, so anything is pretty much possible. So lots of questions here. Let's look at the data. I performed a study of almost 800 COVID long haulers drawn from a number of support groups on Facebook and the Body Politic group on Slack. Respondents were mostly from the UK, although a quarter were from the US, and the remaining 15% split internationally with a large cohort from Sweden. As usual, there are some caveats to this data. The sample is both self-selecting and self-reporting, and the demographic is to some extent a reflection of the use of the social media platforms involved. Knowing all that, let's crack on. Uh, the first big combo question here is this. Does the flu jab A make you more likely to catch COVID, or B uh, have a more severe COVID infection? This study by Zain et al came to the conclusion that no, it doesn't. But they had to do some clever maths to get there, as the two cohorts weren't comparable, due to those having the flu jab generally being more at risk from disease. Dr John Campbell has gone through this in detail on his channel. By all means, check that out if you're interested. What the Zain et al study didn't look at was ongoing symptoms or long COVID. Now, anecdotally, just from the people around me in March, uh, those I knew who had the flu jab had a relatively mild uh, first week or two of infection, but then had some degree of ongoing symptoms, and in my case, full-blown long COVID. Um, those who hadn't had the flu jab uh, had a much more severe initial infection, often with a very high fever in the first week or two, but then recovered to be right as rain relatively quick. 
quickly. And this does tally with Tim Spector's finding that fever uh, is uh, non-correlated with, with the probability of going on to develop long COVID. Is it possible then that having the flu vaccine raises the probability of going on to develop long COVID? There is, after all, long-standing evidence that the flu vaccine does increase the risk of other respiratory infections. Well, to be able to work this out, we need to know the proportion of the population at large who've had the jab. Unfortunately for the UK, I've found it incredibly hard to find that data. Closest I've got that mimics my data sample is this. In England, 45% of vulnerable adults had the jab last winter. So for all adults, this number will be much lower. Let's take a rather generous assumption that 40% of all adults uh, had the jab for flu last winter in the UK. The US does rather better on the vaccination front. The CDC reports vaccination coverage of 48.4% for the 2019-20 flu season. Of the other constituent areas from the sample, Sweden has previously had much lower vaccination rates than the UK. So although that's a small number of people in the sample, it's only going to drag our expected number down. So with 63% of our sample from the UK and 25% from the US, we can put a rough guess on our expected level of vaccination uh, at around 43%. And if the flu vaccine makes your probability of developing long COVID lower, then the number we should see in my sample would be lower than this. And if it makes your probability of catching COVID potentially or going on to develop long COVID higher, uh, then we'd expect to see a higher number than this. And so, how many of those long haulers did have the jab? Well, 53.3%. That's 25% higher than we'd expect. Now, we ought to address some confounding factors. Is my expected number too low due to not including older people? Well, only 3% of my sample were over 70, so that shouldn't drag the data too far in the wrong direction. And could it perhaps be too low due to demographic variation? In America, white non-Hispanic had higher rates of vaccination. And my sample is largely from this group, in the US at least. But again, the US only represents a quarter of my sample. And again, that quarter is not exclusively white and non-Hispanic. So I don't think this factor is going to make too much difference either. So forgive this slightly scrappy intervention uh, with this data, but I am just in the process of finishing this film and I realised I could actually do a slightly better analysis of this data. And that involved breaking out the United States and UK data separately. So if we do that and we go through to look at the numbers specifically for the United States and the United Kingdom, uh, we can see that the number of uh, people taking the, uh, the flu shot in the United States is 64.4%. Uh, compared to in the UK, 54.7%. Now, obviously, the total for the entire study is uh, lower than both of these because the rest of the international territories in there have sort of pulled this number down. But what we can do here is we can look at a direct comparison of, uh, of, of a statistic which we have cleanly, which is the number of adults in the US uh, who take the flu jab last year. And the expected number of that is 48.4% as per the CDC data. And our data here says 64.4%. And this is 33% higher, really, really quite significant. Now, it's harder for us to do a similar thing for the UK because I've not quite been able to find the appropriate uh, figures for that. We know it's somewhere between 22% for the figure of all, all people in the UK, including children and old people, and 45%, which was vulnerable adults under the age of 65. So even if we went to the very highest uh, side there of, let's assume that our entire sample was uh, vulnerable adults under the age of 65, uh, then it's still 21.5% higher than we'd expect. So I really do think that uh, this particular finding uh, from this data is actually quite significant. Uh, so I'll leave it there and uh, jump back into the film as I'd edited it in the first place. So I'd say something fishy is going on here. That flu jab is either uh, like it's been shown with other respiratory illnesses, making you more likely to catch them in the first place, or it's doing something funky to your immune system that makes it more likely to get stuck in that overreactive high gear uh, that drives many of the long COVID symptoms. So let's say that you're in that long COVID group and you're thinking of getting the flu jab this winter. Will the injection of a live attenuated flu virus spark off a relapse of symptoms? Well, let's take a look. Just under half of this group has already had a jab. 17.3% intend to get one, 21.6% aren't sure, and 15.4% definitely won't. 
Firstly, as a control, how was the experience last year? Well, the vast majority who did have the flu jab last year had no adverse effects. 26.5% had some soreness or felt off for a couple of days, and the minority here either felt unwell for longer or had a different experience. How about this year, post-COVID? Well, it doesn't look the same, does it? We're down to about half having no adverse effects, and almost a quarter having some extended consequences. 6.3% say it triggered a full relapse of long COVID symptoms. And how does this compare to that other wretched long COVID experience of catching a cold? Well, compared to catching a cold, it doesn't seem so bad. Most hadn't had a cold, so I need to break the numbers out of this pie chart. Well over half of long haulers have had a dreadful experience with a cold, with 38% experiencing a relapse of long COVID symptoms. So where does this leave us? Now, it's not my place to tell you whether or not to get the flu jab. Uh, look at the data and make your own decision, along with whichever other sources you'd like to rely on. But I do think there are two pretty significant findings in here, and the consequences of those depend on whether or not you've already had COVID. If, like me, you have done and are still struggling with long COVID symptoms, then having the jab appears to be much less bad, actually, than catching a cold. And if this is what a cold does to uh, an easily triggered immune system, imagine what full-blown flu would do. If, on the other hand, you've managed to dodge the rona so far, you might look at the disproportionately high number of flu jabs amongst long haulers and decide that perhaps uh, months and months and months of chronic illness isn't worth the risk. At the end of the day, it's a personal choice, and probably not one that carries the same degree of social conscience that the decision about whether or not to take the COVID vaccine will do when it becomes available. Now, I'm off to try and get my brain fog addled head around the big question of why the flu jab might create this insane immune system overdrive. Uh, but for what it's worth, I do have some data that suggests that there may be other factors that predict the probability of developing long COVID with rather greater accuracy. More on that in my next film. Stay well, and till next time.